All right, so let's continue on with the 30-hour post-licensing course and remind you once again, I'd like you to go to facebook.com slash real university. Hit the like page for me. It helps us out. Yeah, you can like us on YouTube where all these slides and videos are. You can get them and you can get all the other courses as well. All right, so we're going to move on to still in lesson three. We're going to move on to the agency relationship that you are going to have. Now, this is a very powerful slide that has a lot of information on it. So you've got to make sure that you pay attention, take notes, and hopefully you have been practicing this way because this is probably the backbone to the entire profession is this law of agency. It is based in common law, which means it can change over the years. And we have talked about this, that there has been several common law changes to the way agency works. So let's talk about the generic stuff. All right, let's go over here to our whiteboard. The first thing I want to talk about are all the people that play into this group. The first one is obviously is going to be the agent themselves. All right, now this virtually is the managing broker, all right? They are the only agent that is recognized by the state, not you yet, but me. And if you've ever seen the video, uh, Saving Nemo or Finding Nemo, uh, remember the pelicans and they're all like, mine, mine, mine. That's how I want you to think about this because they're all mine. As the managing broker, clients are mine, the money's mine, the listing's mine, the buyers are mine. I am merely allowing you to participate, all right? So there is an agent, and with that, they create an agency relationship with this client. So that agency relationship is created with a client. A client is a person with whom you have an agency relationship. Whether it's express agency or implied agency is irrelevant. You have agency with whom the person you are working. If you are helping a buyer and they did not sign a contract, you still have agency with them. It would be an implied agency. Not necessarily a good idea, and plenty of you have done it. I've done it. It's not the best agency there is, but it still has agency. And with that agency comes these fiduciary responsibilities, which we'll get to here in just a second. Now, the client can actually also be called a principal. All right. They also can be called the buyer or the seller, depending on what side of the table you're on. So that person, that client, so to speak, is someone who it can be called the client, they can be called the principal, or they can be called the seller or buyer if you're on that side of the table. Either one of those three names are interchangeable within your spoken word, your document, however you want to refer to them. You could probably call them Bob. That is, assuming their name's Bob. You don't want to call them Bob if their name is Sue. That would really get you in some trouble. Um, but client, principal, and seller are all the same person. All right? Now, there's one other person I want to talk about is this person here. They are called a customer. A customer is someone with whom, well, let me see if I can spell it right. You actually have no agency with, all right? No agency with that person. That is what creates a customer. That's the definition or the difference between this client and a customer is the fact that you do not have agency with a customer, you do have agency with a client. That agency with your client creates these obligations. Now, with a customer, you do not have the same obligation. You still have 
some obligations to a customer. You have to be honest and truthful, all right? So you can't lie to them. You still have to treat them with care. So you can't give them false information. You can't lie to them. You can't do something purposely to harm them. So you still have to be, finger quotes, nice, but you don't owe your fiduciary obligations to a, that you would to the client. And this relationship pretty much right here is the definition of any agency relationship. You've got Peyton Manning had a sports agent. You've got Britney Spears has a talent agent, which could be questionable, but she still has one. You've got a seller has a real estate agent. All those agencies are exactly the same insofar as client, agent, and a relationship that defines their agency. Where the difference comes in between, say, Peyton Manning and Brittany and Raymond Modulin and you is the responsibilities that create are created by the agency and not anything else, okay? So that is the players in the game. That's who all those names that you should get to know and make sure you understand who's a customer and who's a client and understand that and call them by their correct name. Now, one of the cool things is this job is very, very simple, all right? All you need to do is find a customer, someone you don't have agency with, and make them a client, someone you do have agency with, all right? Seems very simple, and trust me, it is, the concept's simple. The problem is how do you do it, and that's where most people don't, oh, I'm afraid to talk to people, or I don't want to email somebody, or I don't want to bother them. But the whole point in this job is to find a customer and turn them into a client. So if you're standing in line at Starbucks, hopefully someday again we'll be able to do that, and someone in front of you says, hey, I'd like a left-handed double backflip, macchiato, whatever, and I don't speak Starbucks, so I don't know what that means. But they literally are a customer to you. You do not owe them any fiduciary obligations. You still have to be honest and fair to them if they have a question, all right? But all of a sudden he says, yeah, and I'm thinking about selling my house. So you literally tap him on the shoulder and go, hi, I'm Raymond Modulin. I'm the managing broker of the Modulin Group. I'd like to list your house. And he says, sweet, let's do that right now. And signs, you just created agency and now you have a client. And that's the whole name of this game is to go from customer to client. All right. Now let's talk about the relationship that is created and what creates that because the fiduciary responsibilities are what define our agency. We as real estate agents have six responsibilities. They spell out the anagram or acronym. I never get those two correct. Um, what are they, anagram? It's an acronym. Um, an acronym called COLD AC. You've got care, obedience, loyalty, disclosure, accounting, and confidentiality. Those are the definition that define our agency relationship between my client and me. All right. So let's cover these. Care. You owe reasonable skill and care to make sure your client does not get harmed during a transaction. That could be making sure that you do the CMA correctly so that you're listing the property at the right price. There have been many, many court cases where the seller has sued their own agent because the uh, listing agent didn't come back with a good CMA and they sold the property so quick that the seller actually th thought, hey man, you left some money on the table and you now have harmed me. 
So you must make reasonable skill and care to make sure your client does not get harmed. If you're working with a buyer, did you make sure to ask the zoning? Are they trying to put a double in and it's zoned R1? Is it in the commercial world and you're wanting to do environmental stuff and it's zoned you know, C2? You got to make sure that you exercise reasonable skill and care to make sure that your client doesn't get harmed financially, emotionally, physically, spiritually, all kinds of issues like that. Now, during that COVID-19, there was actually some questions about, could the agent be held liable if they're showing a house to a buyer and the buyer got sick from the seller? Was that exercising reasonable skill and care? Did you provide a mask? Did you provide gloves? Did you do all the touching? What happens if you were the listing agent and you allowed a sick uh, viewer to come into the house and leave germs? Not saying where that went to any purpose. There was never a lawsuit that I know of. There was never anything, but there was a question that came up about our fiduciary obligation to our client and allowing potentially people that could have been ill in their someone else's house was that would that have fallen under making sure they didn't physically get harmed obedience you must do what your client says you should do unless it's illegal unethical or immoral all right the last two are on you all right unethical we do have some guidelines through the NAR's Code of Ethics, but we also have things that could potentially be immoral. You need to decide those. But definitely you can't follow things that are illegal. For instance, if you had a client that said, hey, I want you to list my house, but I don't want you to sell it to any Martians. Dude, you're violating the fair housing rule. You can't do that. That decree I cannot follow. Your seller says, hey, man, don't tell anybody about the lead-based paint. We'll never sell this POS. You ha would have to say, man, that's a, that's a federal disclosure. Got to do that. I had a client several years ago in a commercial deal who told me during the weekend that they did not use any form of electricity. They like to live off the grid. And he sent me an email to corroborate this just in case I ever needed it. But he literally told me, hey, sundown, Friday afternoon, 4.35, 6 o'clock, you get any kind of offer or communication, I do not want to see it till Monday morning at sun up. During the weekend, we don't read emails, we don't watch TV, we don't drive cars, we don't do any of that. So do not contact me during the weekend. That is a legal request. There is no violation in that at all. So I followed what my client said, all right? Ultimately, it boils down to what does your client want? And this is something that I, is like my go-to phrase with my agents that are constantly going, well, we got an offer, here's what, what do you think? What do you think about this offer? What do you think? My first question is, what's the client think? Because realize we do not make decisions as an agent. We are an extension of our client. By de facto, we are the ones that present offers and receive offers and do all that. But I am not a decision-making authority. If he says, I want to take that offer, you can piss and moan and whine and cry and bitch all you want and say, hey, look, I think we can get more money. But ultimately, if he says, take the offer, that's what I'm going to do, then that's what you do. Same thing with listing. You go and do a, a CMA and you come back to your client and you say, hey, look, it's between 140 and 145. And they say, I want to list at 170. And there's a whole bunch of arguments we can have in here. And we're not going to for the purpose of this. I just want to prove a point that ultimately you will list the property at 170 or you will not be their agent. You cannot on the drive back to your office go, you know, that dude's whacked. I'm just going to go ahead and list it for 140. You can't do that. You must obey your client's lawful orders. And if you don't like it, you really have no choice other than to surrender agency and let them go about and do their own stuff. Your loyalty. 
Loyalty lies to your client above yours. You should do what's best for your client, not what's best for you. You will see this play out sometimes when your client says, hey, I've got five properties I want to look at, and one of them has like a BAC, which is the buyer's agent commission. Um, if you're outside of our MyBor listing, you may be in another board listening to this. You Somewhere on your listing, it tells you what the buyer's agent commission is going to be. And all of a sudden, you see one at 1%, and the other four are listed at 14%. Big number, I know, trying to prove a point. Here's the thing. Most people would go, oh, look, that listing seemed to have fell, fallen off my desk, and I will show him this one. No, this might be the perfect property for them. Therefore, you must go ahead and show it because the loyalty to your client is far exceeds the loyalty to yourself, even in financial gain situations. Disclosure. You are required to know everything, to tell everything that you know to your client, no matter what side you're on. If I know something, I tell my client. I can't withhold it and go, well, I'm not going to tell them. That would scare them off. Or I don't want to tell them. And that could include knowing something about the other side as well, as long as it's actual knowledge and not hearsay. And what I mean by that is if I get an offer from you from a buyer and the, your buyer's picture was just in the paper as hitting the $300 million lottery, I'm sure as shit going to tell my seller, dude, that's the guy that just hit the lottery. I think he can afford this house. We may not want to argue that hard or harder, depending on how you wanna, what side of that table. We may want to make sure that we don't surrender or lower our price. He's definitely got the money. That would be something that I would know. Even though it's your client, I know it because it's public information. You also have to disclose these things that are called a material defect. A material defect is something that you know that is wrong with the property. It's got a bad roof, got a cracked foundation. All of these things you are supposed to disclose or the seller should disclose on the seller's disclosure. Those must be disclosed so that you can just, if you think about it, it just saves time for both of us. Hey, if I told you we got a cracked foundation and your guy owns a foundation company and he's cool with that, great. But why wait three or four days, pay for an inspection to find out it's got a cracked foundation and all of a sudden you're like, dude, you lied to me or you didn't tell me that. So you must disclose all the material defects. Now, sometimes there's this thing called a latent defect Latent defect is a defect that needs a special inspection. It's not obviously seen by the normal naked eye. The best example of that are termites, all right? And you guys know that we cannot use the word termite anymore, right? They are now called termite Americans. <laughs> no, you actually call them wood-destroying insects, WDIs. You have to be trained to use the word termite and go back and think about uh, when we talked about the home inspector as being one of your team members, we mentioned, hey, you might want to see if your home inspector is certified to be a termite inspector. Otherwise, they're called WDIs. Those would be a latent defect. Hey, I didn't know what it was until after I saw it. Once it becomes a latent defect and you become known, it then becomes a material defect and must be disclosed. If you get a deal that goes south and it should have been disclosed or it wasn't disclosed and now you know, please do not forget to change the seller's disclosure or advise your uh, seller that he needs to update the seller's disclosure because now we know something, all right? So those are all of the care, obedience, loyalty, disclosure, all of that. Those are the first four duties that you would owe to your client, okay? And you owe these duties to them during the agency time frame. Now, what I want to do is take a short break because I don't want to make these files too long all at one time. So we're going to take a break, come back, finish up with all of these fiduciary responsibilities. We're going to talk about terminating 
agency. And then we will also terminate. We're also going to catch up on these two right here. So hold on. We'll be right back.